Um, welcome back to all the students and welcome to all of our other guests. I'm Ann Cooper. I'm the director of the broadcast department uh, here at the journalism school. Wow, it's definitely working now. I can hear it. Um, and I'm also the chair of the jury that selected the uh, winners of the du DuPont Columbia Awards uh, who received their awards last night in the Lowe Library. These DuPont Awards were first presented in 1942 for radio news and later of course um, television was added and the DuPont Awards uh, were given to both uh, the best in radio and television broadcast news. And um, as the DuPont program announced earlier this year, um, last year now, sorry, we're in 2009. Um, this year, uh, in, in the next round of judging, the award will also consider work that has appeared only on the web. Um, regardless of how the story is delivered, though, to its audience, the original criteria for the DuPont Awards will still stand um, as, as it has for the last uh, uh, several decades. As DuPont judges, what we're seeking is to honor journalism that serves the public with aggressive, consistently excellent, and accurate gathering and reporting of news. Um, these awards and today's panels are, uh, uh, and two generous scholarships for our students are all made possible um, by our funders who have just joined us. We were all downstairs discussing the state of the news industry a few minutes ago. Um, and so I want to take a minute to honor um, our supporters, the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and the Alfred I. DuPont Awards Foundation Trust. And I'd like to say a very warm thank you to the trustees from those organizations who are with us here today. Dr. Leroy Davis, who's chair of the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. I'm going to ask you all to, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Reverend Eddie Jones, Jr., Clerical Trustee of the Fund. Um, Mark Constantine is a Senior Fellow at the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. He is here. He was at the awards. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Uh, and also, uh, we want to welcome Evan Astron of Wachovia Bank, who's the manager of the Alfred I. DuPont Awards Foundation Trust. Is Evan in here? Okay, um, anyway, we want to thank all of you so much for um, supporting the very best in broadcast journalism. We've just had a, a good discussion of why these awards are so important, not just to, journalists, to journalism, but uh, to the public, because so many of these awards uh, are given for programs that did a great public service. You know, among the awards we gave last night, um, you know, one ended up closing down a, a horrible nationwide uh, uh, chain of dental clinics for children that was exploiting Medicaid and really exploiting the children and their families. Another led to the release of a man who had been wrongfully imprisoned. Uh, we see so many reports like that and often it's only journalists who are taking the time and putting the resources into investigating these you know wrongful cases that that um, can lead to a reversal and to the restoration of life for somebody who's on death row or you know facing a, a long prison sentence um, so that the impact of this journalism is is one of the things that we focus on and that is really so important to all the rest of the world, uh, you know, in the journalism that we do. And I'd like to say congratulations again to, um, the th to three of the teams that received their awards last night and have agreed to join us here today and uh, to talk about uh, their work. And now we're going to put them to work. Last night was a night of celebration. Um, but today we want them to work and tell us a little bit about their compelling stories how and why they found those stories and decided to report and produce them, uh, what obstacles they had to overcome, uh, and, and what they learned along the way as each of their stories went from just an idea to a gripping broadcast narrative. We're going to spend about an hour with each group of panelists, um, including watching a short excerpt from their award-winning work. And there's a different moderator for, for each of these sessions, and the moderator should leave um, about an hour, or sorry, should leave a little bit of time at the end of the hour for questions from the audience. 
and I was hoping that we would have some microphones. Um, do we, we have microphones we can pass out? Make sure that you ask your questions with a, a mic. I'm very pleased to begin the panels um, with one of the entries, uh, one of the award winners from last night. It's a story called From Russia with Hate, and it was broadcast on current TV and reported and produced by Chris, uh, Christoph Putzel and Lauren Saray. Um, I kind of feel awkward about saying that I'm pleased about talking about this panel because it's really a grim and very violent subject, as you're about to see. In fact, if you go on Current TV's website and um, you watch the program and you look at the comments that, that people have filed, um, the very first one is a complaint saying that, you know, Current had a, a message up there asking viewers to click, uh, you know, whether they liked the program or not. So this first commenter said, to say I like it feels, you know, kind of like I said that I liked what I saw. No, it's creepy, it's horrible, it's tragic. But the truth is, wrote this commenter, I really appreciated seeing this. Um, what you're about to see is uh, a story about Russian skinheads and you know their racist, xenophobic sentiments. The things that they're expressing are not new. Um, the shock of this program comes um, from the, the in-depth look that we get um, of, these, of this particular element of Russian society, um, you know, and their very cynical, increasingly violent campaign that is waged around the country against immigrants from Central Asia and from the Caucasus region of the former Soviet Union. What these groups are doing is launching these random street attacks on people, videotaping them, taking the videotape, editing it, sometimes setting it to music. Um, one double murder, which included a beheading, is set to heavy metal music. Um, uh, we're going to see, I think we're going to see another one of the beatings on videotape where the uh, man who says he's the propagandist behind this effort says, oh yes, we chose some rather merry music for this one. Um, it's very chilling stuff. These, once the videotapes are edited, uh, they're put on the internet where the skinheads hope that these uh, very strong visuals will inspire others to raise their fists or even weapons against the hapless immigrants uh, in, in Russia today. This violence is so pervasive and so unchecked, according to this documentary, that in the days surrounding uh, the April birthday of Adolf Hitler, Foreign students in Russia are instructed to stay in their dorms locked down at all times so that they do not become victims of this violence. Let's take a look at From Russia With Hate. After a few hours of driving, we arrived and hiked about a mile into the woods. I had no idea where we were, but the location looked similar to ones I'd seen on the internet, where skinheads train in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Recruits had gathered from all around the country for a weekend of training and the annual initiation into the NSO. Устраиваем полосу препятствий. Ну, конечно, часть подготовки. Дело в том, что мы считаем в данный момент в этой стране при этой политической системе уважающий себя русский человек должен быть постоянно готовым. Следующий. 
цель нашей тренировки во всем. Мы должны уметь драться и в случае, скажем так, обострения ситуации, и в повседневной жизни. It wasn't exactly clear to me what some of these exercises were supposed to be for, but these young recruits took the training very seriously. Идет этническая экспансия на нашу землю, идет замещение, как я уже сказал, замещение нашего народа на прежних чужаков. Поэтому любые формы сопротивления этому их можно только поприветствовать. Террора, насилие, взрывов, убийств, все оправдано во имя собственной нации. What do you personally do to preserve the society that you want? Вполне логично вам рассказать, что участвую в работе этой организации, которую вы, собственно, сегодня посетили. А больше, я надеюсь, вы понимаете, я ничего вам сказать не могу. Почему? Сами не догадываетесь? But then I was introduced to Tsak, a skinhead whose nickname means hatchet in Russian. Tsak wasn't shy about his participation in street fights. What is the purpose of uh, going out and causing these street fights? Может быть, многим даже придется умереть. Что они должны быть просто к этому готовы, потому что начнутся беспорядки скоро массовые, уличные. И мы должны быть готовы к ним. Tsak gave me a DVD to play on my laptop. He boasted that he'd created many of the videos I'd watched back in the dorm room, and he had plenty more to show. Можно развернуть, это очень хороший ролик. Музыка веселая, конечно. Burning his passport. No, 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 So who is this that they're beating now? Whatever happened to this guy? Did he survive? You seem to get a lot of pleasure watching these. Huh? You seem to like watching these. You get a lot of pleasure. Yes. Самое приятное то, что это как бы закрутил процесс. Ты я вот это вот все съемки на видео. Это именно то, чем я вообще занимаюсь. Это сейчас моя профессия. Пропаганда. Человек посмотрел, думает, да, слушай, красиво, я тоже так хочу. И пошел кого-нибудь зарезать. Tsak's propaganda has a growing audience. It's estimated that over half of the world's neo-Nazis now live in Russia, between 50 and 70,000. <laughs> When the training was finished, Dmitri escorted me out of the woods, and I left Russia the next day. A few weeks later, Tsak was arrested and imprisoned on charges of instigating ethnic hatred and threatening violence. But in August, a video was released on one of Russia's most popular file-sharing sites, demanding Tsak's release from prison. It featured two dark-skinned young men in an unknown location in the woods, bound and on their knees. The men are gruesomely executed, one decapitated with a knife, the other shot in the head. A note accompanying the video also demanded the expulsion of all Asians and people from the Caucasus from Russia, and it called for the establishment of a new national socialist government to be led by Dmitry. The video quickly became one of the most widely circulated internet videos in Russia. 
it's still not known who created it. I'd like to have the producers of the program come up now, Christoph Putzel and uh, Lauren Saray, please. Um, Christoph is a correspondent and a producer for Current TV's Vanguard Journalism Department. I have to say Vanguard Journalism sounds a little bit Soviet. <laughs> um, but your reports are certainly in the vanguard of the news. Um, some of the topics that Christoph has reported on, uh, besides Russian skinheads, are the exploitation of child gold miners in Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and the state of Somalia in 2006 after Islamist militants seized control of the capital, Mogadishu. Um, and we were talking last night that you had, uh, again, recently tried to get back to Mogadishu, um, instead went to Yemen to do a story that will be coming up, I guess, on uh, uh, Somali refugees fleeing the country. Um, in an early schoolboy era of his life, uh, Christoph lived in Moscow with his journalist parents who are here today, Michael Putzel and Ann Blackman. Um, he's a graduate of Connecticut College where he produced a documentary about AIDS orphans in Kenya that won the Student Academy Award and was screened at the Cannes Film Festival in 2003. Lauren Saray is an award-winning producer for Current TV. She got her start in journalism, traveling with her journalist father. She's a graduate of uh, the Colorado College and has produced um, also a variety of documentaries for Current TV, including stories on environmental issues in Madagascar and post-traumatic stress disorder among veterans of the war in Iraq. I wanted to ask you both about um, uh, a moment that we just saw in here that sparked quite a, a discussion uh, when we were uh, judging the entries for the DuPont Awards. Um, the jury really took uh, uh, quite a close look at that moment where you're sitting in the woods, you've met to sock, um, the Apple computer comes out. Whose Apple computer was that? That uh, was mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, you're watching videos with him, he's kind of giggling, um, you know, looking for something really good to show you. Um, and you say to him, you seem to get a lot of pleasure out of watching these. Um, and he says yes and describes, you know, his purpose is propaganda um, and, um, you know, what he hopes is that other people are going to go out and do the same thing. It's an awkward moment, to say the least, for a journalist. And um, at the very end, we, we didn't see this, but at the very end of the program, um, uh, Christoph talks about the difficulty of, of covering a story like this uh, when you do not want to become an unwitting carrier of the message of your subjects. In other words, you don't want to be condoning it. Uh, but what do you do? Um, and I'd like to hear you talk about being in the woods and what you were thinking about. And, you know, did you, I imagine it was probably a little bit scary, but did you think about trying to be confrontational, to confront them, uh, to, you know, say what, you perhaps thought about what it was that they were doing. How did you, how did you deal with that? I think this, that was, uh, without a doubt, the most difficult aspect of this effect. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that was without a doubt the most, um, uh, the most difficult part of this entire trip. And that, those are questions that were probably going through our head every single minute of, the, of every day. <laughs> yeah. um, doing this piece because um, it was difficult. And in those moments, uh, when we first went to the woods, the, uh, the way that we show the piece is very much, we try to show it uh, so the audience experience is very similar to what we experienced when we first went there. We didn't know where we were. And we just see all of these guys with a lot of weapons uh, running around, running in fire. And uh, we just tried to show it just the way they're holding for us. So we, um, this curiosity of what the hell have we gotten ourselves into here. And, and then um, when Tasak starts showing us those pieces, um, I mean, there was, I think one, there was a, it was an incredible amount of violence that we just showed just a tiny bit of what we actually saw. Uh, and we were trekking that fine line of all of the people with this. Yeah. 
so yeah, so there's a point of us where we were relieved that we were, we were, we were there and getting it, and then, um, uh, but then you know, others followed me the question, how do we do this? How do we do this tastefully? But at the same time, when he's showing us all these videos and seeing these points of people um, uh, who we don't know whether or not they're alive or dead, or, um, uh, you know, this was a story that needed to be told, and while uh, you, you can uh, uh, sometimes just read these statistics until you actually see it uh, and the problem is addressed, uh, nothing's going to be done about it. And since we've left, even with our reporting, the problem has gotten worse. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned last night, just this week, a young journalist who was investigating an outstanding police was shot and killed in downtown on Seattle, brought daylight. And uh, unless these stories get told, nothing is going to get done about it. So we just have to walk that fine line of um, um, telling their story uh, about what they're doing, what they're making, and interactions with um, without knowing it. I believe that anyone that saw them all around me can watch these pieces and really uh, great. Do you know, um, I mean, was your piece aired in any way within Russia? I mean, uh, do, you, do you know? It became really popular on YouTube. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, it's got several hundred thousand things. Um, and I just looked at the comments and got the blogs and all that, most of them are Russian. Um, uh -huh. And so, no, it never, it never aired. Um, but just also, just this, uh, six days ago, uh, saw was sentenced to, um, he was already, he already been in prison after the left, and now he was sentenced to another three and a half years after another video uh, came out. And, uh, uh, and he was trying to play, but he was uh, in the What about Russian media coverage of the skinheads? Is there much? It's there, um, but um, I think one of the reasons that we got as far as we did have the access is that we were uh, this young two-person crew that wasn't very intrusive uh, to that. We didn't have a big camera to perform. Um, uh, you know, they, they put us to the test too, um, when we first went there where uh, Dimitri wanted to meet with us first without any cameras, and uh, he was kind of testing us out to see, and he was very concerned that were we just going to do a piece that would, uh, you know, in his, the way he kept on phrasing it, were we, we going to put our own, um, you know, our, yeah, our own agenda in uh, his and we assured him that people will just tell the story, just tell the story, we'll listen, and I feel that that's what we did. Uh, we try not to implement any judgments in the piece. Oh, great, thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, and so as far as Russian media coverage, it's there, but uh, I, I haven't seen people get in this, as, get in, go into their training camps. Mm -hmm. so. And how about the law enforcement response? We didn't see one of the early scenes that you shot, which was, I think it was on Hitler's birthday, mm -hmm big street demonstration in Moscow, I guess. Um, there were actually metal detectors up there, and it looked like police who were providing security. And yeah. I mean, visually, it looked like they were sanctioning it, like they were protecting the skinheads who had come out to demonstrate. Yeah, that's right. And uh, there, when we talk to, when you talk to anybody there, um, a lot of them say the police are part of the problem. Um, they, you know, the police aren't paid very high. They feel this, uh, a lot of the sentiment. It's not that everyone there by any means is going out and beating people up, uh, 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 being ethnic minorities up. But you know, the, the, 
the police don't get paid that much, and uh, a lot of them uh, do resent what's happened to their country, and uh, and they believe that the the statistics that we have of so many people uh, of of how many people have gotten beaten up or have been killed over this past year, they actually believe that they're much, much higher because so many of them don't go reported. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we went to a, um, a university in Moscow for a lot of foreign students, and they um, pretty much every person we talked to um, had experienced hate um, just walking around, um, just going about their lives. And a lot of them mentioned that, you know, it's, it's almost not even worth really causing attention to, to what happened to them um, unless they need medical attention to go to the hospital they just sort of it's sort of a, fa a really horrible fact of life that sort of I think they sort of knew and uh, arranged their lives around it to be home before dark to walk in groups all these sorts of things and another question that we kept asking ourselves the whole time was um, how are they able to get away with this so much in the, uh, so in the open uh, it's a country that is run by people who spent their entire lives in the intelligence business. And if they actually wanted to squash these guys, you'd think that they'd be able to pretty easily. Yeah. Um, well, they certainly ban any kind of political opposition demonstrations, and yet, you know, this group can very openly go out in the streets and apparently be protected and sanctioned by the police. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a very striking image. Um, what do you know about the arrest of? to sock and was there I mean do you think in any way that um, you know your story may have brought some shame on officials or um, you know made them feel like maybe we need to throw a little sop and arrest this guy and make uh, it look like we're responding his, his first arrest um, uh, was that what they the charges that they got him on were instigating hatred and, and threatening violence from when he entered a, uh, I think it was a, it was a gay rights parade that he had gone and um, was... Using hate language. Yeah, yeah, using hate and threatening war, and he had this, and it was one of the only things that they actually had him, that they could nail him on, and, this, and they were trying to do this actually while we were there, and he was, they picked him up just a few weeks later, and this... And his most recent charge, um, I don't know if we can be as presumptuous enough to think that, uh, I don't know. We certainly got, this piece certainly got, was very popular in Russia and did get a lot of attention. I, I, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah. We were sort of shocked that the charge came from um, him making racial statements at, you know, a public place. It's like. Of, of all the things, you know, <laughs> could for, yeah. I think it'd be. what about Dmitry Rumyantsev, who we see only briefly here, but he's a character earlier in the story, and he's the one who took you to the. Woods. We we were in touch with him recently. He 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 wrote to me to congratulate me on the Emmy nomination, which um, we thought was really bizarre. Uh, uh, and oh, and he was he's currently. Uh, he's on the run in the sense where he is, didn't show up to court for um, uh, to be charged, and he's currently. Uh, I don't think he's talking to any journalists right now, and he's uh, he's in hiding, trying to just avoid going to going to trial. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how how strongly he's actually being pursued, um, but uh, yeah, we I am, and that's how I know that. Uh, uh, he gives hmm. me a little updates on, on how he's doing, hmm. and. Um, uh, and, you know, they, after this incident happened when these guys were, um, when the uh, video was released of the, of the men being executed, uh, there's, there's been a lot of skepticism about who really made it. Um, uh, um, Dimitri at the time uh, was very silent about it because his name was mentioned in it, but Koryanovich, the, uh, who you don't see in this piece, uh, in the clip that you saw, but he's a, a member of parliament who we interviewed who, is, um, uh, who supports these guys. And he, had, you know, he, he went out saying that he thought that uh, they were being framed, that the, it was actually the FSB, the, um, the new version of the KGB who had made this tape, trying just to create a distraction. Um, you know, uh, and seemed incredibly adamant about it, but uh, uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Tell us about current TV. It's now existed for what three years. Yeah, three years. How did three both of you yeah. end up working there? Um, I sort of start current is um, sort of a youth 
generate youth oriented network and um, we rely heavily on sort of user generated videos and content and so I sort of started the organic way at current by actually submitting something and then um, sort of through that um, got involved in Vanguard. And Lauren was one of our first contributors. Um, yeah, so it's been, I'd say about 20 or 20 or 30 percent of our staff kind of came through that way, mm -hmm. um, sort of but in the initial stages. when you say stages. through that, you continued pitching or yeah, I, they said, hey, we like that, we've got something Lauren was very talented. We grabbed her immediately, <laughs> uh, is, is actually what happened. Uh, you uh, made a, a piece that I had the pleasure of being asked to narrate when it came in. Uh, it was a... Um, uh, can you describe what was the piece? Yeah, it was a piece about um, Marines' reaction to sort of television coverage of, of the war in Iraq. Um, there was a show called Over There on the FX network that has since gone away. But um, it was sort of their reaction to, you know, a dramatic series about a war that's still existing um, at that time. So. And it was really authentic. It was raw. And Lauren uh, came in and we uh, were excited to get it on and I, I remember um, actually um, Laura Ling is the head of our department is, is here and I remember Lauren uh, Laura saying to me um, uh, wow it's really look how um, uh, uh, her and her co-producer Tyler how organized they were because they'd come in in these binders that were just like everything was just so perfect and how they were going to lay this piece out and um, so uh, we yeah, snatched up Lauren pretty quickly. There's about 15 of us in the Vanguard department, and um, we all sort of work in twos or threes, and sort of all work in different groups. And it's been a it's been a really great, a really amazing um, three years of just a lot of learning and a lot of growing, just mm -hmm. us and our stories and our story selection and, and what we've been doing. So yeah, what and it was like, the Vanguard department. We uh, we're current journalism department. Um, there's yeah 15 of us and. Uh, we usually go out in two-man, sometimes three-man teams uh, to different areas in the world and try to report on stories that aren't getting uh, that much mainstream media attention and try to tell the stories in a way that will be relevant to our demographic, people like us that aren't just like watching the news. You know? And we have the uh, luxury of being able to produce in-depth pieces. Um, we have a show every Wednesday at 10 o'clock that is a half hour, and um, we have stories from, I mean, every, so what's this season consist of? A um, uh, piece on robots in Japan, um, <laughs> America's Secret War um, in Iran, um, what else, uh, pirates? Uh, yeah, we, um, pirates in Indonesia, um, uh, fr uh, people going, coming out of prison, um, uh, we, I mean, we've got, I mean, this goes on and on, uh, uh, you know, so, so many, uh, we're very fortunate to have, to be able to actually be practicing journalism going around the world and producing these pieces. And it, it is challenging because we, we do, we are responsible for producing a lot of content with not very many people. Um, we uh, are, literally will have two, max three people working on a project, working on a half hour piece. Um, to turn out every week, <laughs> so um, so it's a lot. Uh, but uh, and what are you? What what skills do you have to have to do this? I mean, I see you in some of these images. You're carrying a camera. Both of you had cameras. Yeah, we both had cameras. Um, I I started off uh, training as being able to do everything. So um, from being a correspondent to a producer to an editor to um, everything. I we have a little more support now where we have um, uh, editors that can help us um, edit our pieces, but some of us edit our own pieces. Um, and But yeah, you, the way television's moving, and especially for current, is the more skills you have, the better, and the more things that you can do, uh, the better. For me, since I always started off uh, filming my own pieces, I don't feel comfortable going out without a camera. I, I like to be shooting. I, I, I love it. I um, don't actually look at myself that much as just a correspondent staring at the camera it's not really my for me it's not really my thing I like to I, I, I like to be made I like to be crafting the piece and uh, yeah um, I'd say most of the people on our team can um, shoot and produce and then a few you know shoot produce and edit as well and correspond so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of um, I think sort of our because of our, our background and sort of growing up having access to to you know final cut being 
relatively you know, accessible. Um, a lot of people on the team know how to edit and, and, and craft all their own pieces, too. Just. I want to throw this open to questions. Is there a, ah, there is a microphone. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah, um, for me, I uh, I love to use a uh, small camera called the uh, the Sony A1U. Um, it's a tiny HD video camera that's um, can kind of pass as a consumer touristy camera, and when I'm trying to be a little more official, kind of look like a professional camera. It's just that happy medium. And for me, the reason I I like it is because um, it's inconspicuous, it's very, you know, you can, when I have to put it down, I can. But one of the main reasons is because I shoot my own interviews and like, I always find that I have to maintain a strong connection with the person that I'm interviewing, looking them in the eye and just, and being present with them. And for me, it's just a very light object that I can just kind of have uh, up next to me while maintaining that eye contact and not having my arm get too tired. and worry about, you know, am I getting the shot perfect? And, um, yeah, we, had, um, we had a lot of trouble filming in Russia. I mean, we had to actually take off the um, sort of the mic attachment sort of makes it look a little bit more professional. And oftentimes we have to take that off and just sort of use the on-camera mic just to sort of look as if we were tourists or, you know, yeah, we just, didn't have anything fancy. And so when we were filming in shoot, Red Square, uh, like the permits to actually film in Red Square like, cost 20 grand or something like that. And so we just made it look like we were just taking pictures yeah. of, the, of uh, 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 like tourists, you know. And, uh, and so that's what, I, that's, that's what I prefer to use. It's only recently, um, actually, Lauren, we were discussing this last week, that I have found that I, I would, you know, as you start, I, I used to not care as much about how, how everything was shot as long as the content was there. And now I am trying to improve in every aspect and I have looked to upgrade the camera a little bit to get some better color. And you started shooting on the V1, right? The yeah, we have V1U, Sony V1Us, which is sort of the next tier up. And um, I, I guess it just depends on the shoot. If we, we um, look less intrusive, we, we go for the smaller ones. But if, um, you know, for some of our other pieces that are, are less threatening, it's, I, I, I prefer the, the slightly bigger camera. Um, the V1U. That'll give you a little more nice color. And uh, the rest of that current is in, in, edits everything entirely on Final Cut Pro. Um, uh, it's the only edit system that we use. And uh, I personally love it. I think it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know anyone our age who's still editing on Avid. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> is that the curriculum? Uh, well, that's just us. Um, and well, it's the way the industry is moving. Yeah, you know, and, and it's amazing how quickly it has started. That turns yeah, I mean, it's, being it's able to edit that. on your laptop is an incredible thing. Yeah. You know. Uh huh. Um, do we have a microphone for? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, congratulations and bravo. Um, <clears throat> how did you find your sources? Did you have them before you went to Russia? And how did you get them to trust you? Um, we went through a couple different avenues. Uh, we put a lot of feelers out uh, initially. Uh, I, you know, I had lived in Moscow um, as, a, as a kid and hadn't been back since I was 10 years old and frantically started reaching out to uh, all of the old friends of my parents who were, uh, you know, old journalist hacks asking for any kind of contacts that they had. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, initially we were given, um, you know, it was, it was funny to go to, we went back to, my mom wrote for Time Magazine there and we went back to uh, uh, 
you know, when it had been a big bureau, now there only being one guy left uh, who had been the translator is now running the entire bureau. He was the bureau. Um, and he had, he had hooked us up with a young translator, this kid who was just getting started, uh, who was anxious to work, who was cheap, and who had contacts with these skinheads. Um, and so we uh, grabbed him and uh, tooled around with him. We had, and yeah, we had a couple of snafus. Um, you know, not all of these groups like each other, so they all have sort of the same cause, but they, they don't. It's sort of, uh, not all these groups um, sort of like each other, and there's lots of different fragments of these groups, and so we had a little bit of a, a crisis, sort of um, getting in with one group. Um, they found out we were talking to another group. Didn't it was, yeah. When we, when we uh, switched, we switched fixers at one point. Um, we were, uh, we went and also met with this woman uh, uh, who had worked for AB, a, C C CBS for uh, years. She was about 90 years old. Uh, and we thought like, oh man, like, what are we doing with a fixer that's 90 years old? <laughs> uh, and she was amazing. I mean, she just ended up being, you know, sometimes you just need someone, places like Russia, who's just knows how to get things done, knows the right people, who can work in the old communist system and has been doing it forever. And um, uh, so she kind of sped way, our through, way through the visas. And um, uh, at one point when D D uh, Dimitri had cut off contact with us, um, uh, we don't know exactly what she did, but we asked for a favor, and she gave him a phone call and uh, gave him a talking to, I think scared him, and uh, um, punished him like he was five years old. And, um, uh, and then eventually we ended up getting a phone call. I don't know if that had much to do with it or not. But, um, and, and it was a lot of hit or miss. How we got them to trust us was we initially met with, Dimitri insisted in initially meeting without cameras, wanted to check us out, see if we were just going to do, uh, you know, tear them apart. And showed up with, um, we met at a neutral location, and he sat across from me, very similar to how you, um, the interview that's in the piece. And I remember, we spent about two hours with him staring me down. We basically had a staring contest and seeing who would look away first. Uh, and this was like, you know, to test I guess my manhood, if I could stand up to him, and um, I, I, I won a couple of them. I, uh, um, was he talking with? You? Yeah, we, we, we he, he would talk, and then we you know we had the translator. My my I haven't spoken Russian since I was a kid, so it's um, couldn't really understand everything. And so, but a translator that was sitting behind me, we just kind of kept this. You know, he would say something. We have a two-minute translation, but while we're just staring at each other in the eye. Um, and meanwhile, they're they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> um, but and but another thing that really helped us was uh, he he brought with him who um, a young woman that he called his press officer, um, who was really um, his girlfriend, who was just this 19-year-old girl who worshipped him um, and looked up, and she had been hanging out with these thugs for the past couple of years, and Lauren was the first girl I think she'd seen in a while, <laughs> and latched on to Lauren. Um, and every time we saw each other, they had this weird rapport that even Dimitri and I didn't quite understand uh, of, you know, bringing chocolate for each other and whatever. She would always look forward to seeing Lauren, and that without a doubt had a lot to do with, um, you know, I'm sure that she was now, hey, let's go see those weird journalists again, you know. Um, and so eventually, I think, that helped, and also we, I really felt that we did a fair job of portraying them just the way that we, they were. Um, we listened. I think that was the, um, I think that's what was most important while we um, certainly challenged them. We, we really did listen with, with open ears trying to understand what would drive people to this kind of hatred. Um, we also went over, um, we, we went, we sort of started researching the story in about January, February, um, and then we, uh, hit, we decided to go over Hitler's birthday because it's sort of when they, um, it's sort of their annual celebration. And so it was sort of a, 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 a weird dynamic because at, this, at, one, at the same time, they're, they're really anxious to get out their, their propaganda at this time, but then they're also really, really um, trying to be sort of stealth and under the radar. And so we were sort of playing this fine line of, um, you know, are they, do they, 
want, you know, are they, you know, out and about on the streets at these protests or are they, you know, underground? And it would go literally one day at the protests, the next day saying, you know, we can't drive anywhere. They, we think they've, they've caught on to us and, and all this sort of stuff. So it was a really yeah, it was weird. A, we, we, it was a weird cat and mouse game uh, um, uh, a lot of the time. But we eventually gained the trust. I mean, it was a long, that was a long car ride outside of Moscow when the, when the most awkward you know, um, spent two or three hours in this car driving outside the city, and uh, you know, we'd stop and have like a picnic, or and, and you know, it was just. And at that point, we just had to be on this friend level, like, oh yeah, I would like some more cheese and crackers, and like, th thank you, and uh, yeah, it was weird, but. <laughs> Did you have any debate about whether to go with Dimitri? Uh -huh. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, he, he was playing all—he was playing all these games with us. You know, he said, we, "You, you guys have to have to. We have to go in an unmarked car with no license plates and all this sort of thing." And it was this weird. You know, he couldn't tell us. Um, uh, we were actually leaving the next day, and so sort of logistically, we were sort of curious. You know, well, when will we be back to Moscow? Because you know, we got this flight, and you know, he wasn't—he wasn't telling us. In the woods. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we yeah, there was a little debate <laughs> between us if we were going to go. Um, uh, but yeah, we decided we'd see where it took us. So. Um, I was wondering on a sort of national cultural level in Russia. Um, first, actually, I forgot to congratulate you again. Thank you. But um, as as far as the the Russian culture, is there an understanding of the situation that the minority communities are in? Is there obliviousness, so on? I remember a couple of years ago, back in Pittsburgh, I did a murder follow up feature that my editor finally let me do, and uh, we got two kinds of mail. One to speak to Professor Cooper's point, where it was, how could you eulogize these thugs? Like, how could you commemorate the death of a 14 year old in this way? Because it was sort of like, you know, what kind of video games did he like? How he was a normal kid, and so on. Um, and then the other kind was, we didn't know that this was what Pittsburgh was like. And you think, well, there's been a murder every d other day in Pittsburgh for the past 15 years. How could you not know that? And I'm wondering if the Russian national identity is sort of in accord with that, is oblivious to it, pities people. I, I think it's all over the place. Um, I think, in general, uh, people are very aware of it uh, and uh, understand the problem. However. Um, you know, there was, there, there's certainly, there's been a little negative reaction, I mean, just from some of the comments who just, uh, of people who just felt that uh, we were, you know, um, you know, as anyone would be when they feel, uh, you know, when they see a con their country portrayed in a, a dark light. Um, uh, there's been mixed reaction, uh, I'd, I'd say, but I think in general, um, no one's ever questioned its authenticity. I mean, I as Russians, like they know it exists, they know it's out there. Um, I think that many of them, I think, if anything, most are, are incredibly uh, saddened and surprised to see things like a rally being allowed to be to and the Hitler salute uh, uh, being able to uh, even occur in the middle of the city. With you know, when they have when many people are still alive who have memories of of their history with the Nazis. So. Let's take a couple more questions, and can I ask people to come up to this mic? Do you, and if you have a question, can you come on up and, and wait so we don't lose time passing the mic around? Hey, congratulations, Christoph and Lauren, on your award. Um, my question um, is actually regarding current TV. Um, I'm curious as to how story and content is generated, um, uh, as well as you know, how, um, sort of what what. How much is actually generated from the staff on hand, and how much is freelance that comes in? And I mean, as somebody who's involved in both long and short form documentary, is there a submission process um, for getting involved with current TV? Um, yeah, we, um, you know, current prides itself on on being a, 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 an open network where you uh, everyone can submit ideas and submit uh, pieces. So, uh, what I encourage anyone to do who's who's interested in getting involved is. Upload a piece to the website. Um, there's an entire process. If you can go on, you can go online. It can tell you how to do it, and and pieces get voted on um, in the current community. And uh, the more people see it, it gets voted up, and that's when it starts grabbing attention. And that's when you know we'll grab it to put on air to um, uh, 
to buy. Um, uh, and all the pieces get vetted. To Sometimes we've got some editing to do with it, or we'll um, contact the submitter and have them clean it up a little bit. To, um, but uh, yeah, if you go to the website, it, it tells you everything about how to get involved. Um, yeah, and as far as the con how much, um, I'd say it used to be. Yeah, I think it's I think it's thirty percent is um, uh, submitted by uh, freelancers, users, users in our community, and uh, the rest is in house. Yeah. We do one more question. Anybody have a final question? No. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your piece. And this question is for Lauren, which was um, the, in the piece, everyone is, is, is uh, male, and um, all of the subject matter is, is very you know, violent. It's a very aggressive, masculine um, culture. And I was wondering, as a woman journalist, what te techniques did you use when you were approaching these <laughs> subjects? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was um, physically and emotionally a really draining trip for, for both of us. Chris have had some really bad back issues afterwards. And it was, it was, um, it was just a. You know, I think actually the Dimitri's girlfriend was sort of the, the only person I could really sort of talk to in a weird way, and um, I think that she sort of related that on to Dimitri, and um, so not that that was like a, a great friendship or anything, but <laughs> but it was um, it was a connection. You know, she's she was you know I was 25 at the time; she was like a few years younger than I was, so it was a really a, you know it was just it was sort of a we could we could relate. Um, it was really hard. I mean, I was I'm not gonna lie. I was really scared. Um, I think I was the one whole. <laughs> I was definitely thinking, oh, gosh, we really have to go to the woods. You know, mm -hmm. I think my mom's gonna be really upset about this. You know, <laughs> but um, so you know, it was it was a really a really tricky situation. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that was sort of um, n not that I had going for me, but um, just the way I look um, was non-threatening to them, and it was a that was a, that was also a really weird dynamic too. Um, but you know, Kristoff and I—we—we we, it's such a great pleasure working with Kristoff, and I think because we work in gr groups of two, that also helps. Um, we we sort of—I don't know—we we just we just want to ask questions, and we're here to listen, and we I think just try to play that role as much as we can. Um, but it was it was a really for. I mean, I was I was a little I was pretty drained after it, just being in this really aggro um, community of people and. Um, you know, it was, it's, when you showed up at the camp, it was, um, Dimitri's girlfriend was there, but I was the only other woman there, and there was probably 80, 80 men with mm. arms. <laughs> and I have to admit to being um, uh, a little bit oblivious to that fact in, in, in the beginning. There was um, one point when we'd gotten a lead that there was going to be a serious training session in St. Petersburg, um, but at the same time, there was this amazing, there's going to be this incredible skinhead uh, gathering in Moscow. And so, you know, my first reaction was like, let's split up. And um, uh, I actually got a plane ticket and like went to, it was trying to get myself to St. Petersburg. And Lauren call, uh, Lauren was going to be, you know, going to this skinhead heavy metal concert by herself and uh, called um, a, a contact that we'd met, just a friend of a friend of a friend uh, who happened to be there. And Lauren said, can you come and protect and be my my muscle. This, meanwhile, this is a skinny dude. Like, uh, <laughs> that, that is a good point. Yeah, I was when we separated. I was I was a little nervous, and so at that point, yeah, I called a friend of a friend and just said, "This sound might sound a little weird, but can you come with me to a skinhead rally?" You know, um, <laughs> and but it was reassuring to know that you know I I didn't want to. I just I didn't feel comfortable being with eighty guys in <laughs> punk rock. So. We did not split up in the end. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Yeah. Lauren Christoph, again, congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.